Hello and welcome to the next talk in the 2021 series of the Open UK Future Leaders Training Sessions. Please note this meeting is being recorded and will be made available soon afterwards on our YouTube channel. First, a little about the Open UK Future Leaders Group. The Future Leaders Group is a collection of individuals who are interested in open technologies, including open source software, open hardware and open data. It includes a wide range of people that work in technology, intellectual property, outsourcing, procurement, data, coding and, and innovation, as well as private practice lawyers and in-house counsel that work in the technology sector and related fields. It operates under the direction of the Open UK Legal and Policy Committee and has a clear purpose to bring together and develop future leaders in legal and policy matters relating to open technologies and to support and further the mission of the Legal and Policy Committee. The Future Leaders Group is currently co-chaired by me, Robert Grinnells, and I'm from Phil Fisher, and Katie Gibson from Bristow's, and we're both lawyers advising on technology and commercial matters. The group is always open to new ideas and to new members, whether getting involved in all of our activities or just dipping in and out of our various projects, so please do get in contact if you'd like to get involved. And for today's session, we're pleased to be joined by Roberto de Cosmo. Roberto is an alumnus of the Scuola Normale Superiore de Pisa, with a PhD in Computer Science from the University of Pisa. Roberto was an associate professor for almost a decade at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. In 1999, he became full professor in computer science at the University Paris Diderot, where he was head of doctoral studies for computer science from 2004 to 2009. He's also a trustee of the IMDEA Software Institute in Madrid and a member of the National Committee for Open Science in France. And he's currently on leave at INRIA, the French National Institute for Research in Digital Science and Technology. In 2008, he created and coordinated the European research project Mancusi that had a budget of 4.4 million euros and brought together 10 partners to improve the quality of package based open source software systems. In 2015, he created Now Direct Software Heritage, an initiative to build the universal archive of all the source code publicly available in partnership with UNESCO. Roberto has over 20 years of engagement in open source, in advocacy, software development and in funding public private research and development partnerships. And so we're delighted he can join us today. As usual, we'll have a chance for any questions at the end, so please do pop them in the chat and we'll invite you on to voice and video if you'd like to ask them yourself. Uh, Roberto, welcome to our session today and thank you for joining us and over to you to talk about Software Heritage. Okay, thanks a lot for uh, having me here. Maybe I will switch the camera to this one so you see me looking at the slides while I present them. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me uh, with you today. It's a pleasure to come and tell you a little bit or about what we are doing at Software Heritage, which is a common infrastructure uh, preserving and sharing all of our software commons. Uh, as Robert was kindly uh, doing the introduction, uh, you, what you may retain is that I have been 30 years working in academia for doing research, high level research and education, 20 years in open uh, software as an advocate, as a developer, and uh, uh, um, directing structure there, and then 10 years. Uh, building and directing structure for the common good. Uh, the one we are going to talk to today about is software writers. Uh, we, you will have all these in the slides online so you can get into, into this information if you're curious later on. Well, software heritage is something which is uh, interested with something which is software source code. If you look around us, uh, you see that all of our work today depends on digital infrastructure and in particular on, on uh, the internet on one side and on all these programs and applications, including the one we are using today to have this remote meeting. But a lot of people still see this as just some kind of just tools. Okay, it is software, this is an application, something you click on a button and it just works. But actually software doesn't come out of nowhere. It is written and developed by humans in the form of software source code. You know, when I was a student uh, at the university many, many years ago, you can see it from the data of the book I'm mentioning here, I read a book by Ardor Abelson, who is an MIT professor, and in the, pre in the introduction of the book, there was this mythical phrase, I mean, programs must be written for people to read in the first place, and only incidentally for machines to execute. It is kind of the reverse of what we are used to, to see you know, in our everyday life. Well, when he was writing this in 1985, there was not much source code available publicly to show what this actually meant. Today, we have an incredible amount of, uh, uh, it's a treasure trove of software source code which has become available, in particular, 
thanks to the free software and open source movement. Here are a couple of examples, just to give you an idea what, I, what this professor actually meant. You see, this is an excerpt of the source code of the Apollo 11 uh, guidance and control computer. Uh, here on the left, you see a mnemonic assembly code that will be translated in uh, actually uh, uh, executable instruction for the machine. And here on the right, you see after this uh, number sign, there are a lot of comments in English, which are actually messages not for the machine, because there are no trace of these comments will ever get to the execution on the machine. These are messages to the other people who will be reading this source code to understand what the program is actually going to do. And these other people may be the same person who wrote the software that need to go back and understand what he wrote a couple of weeks before. So this is software from the 60s that is available thanks to the fact that uh, uh, software developer, developer under national, uh, so, sorry, federal funding in the US is, is uh, in, in the public domain. So that's the reason why we have it today. Later on, uh, you have a lot of software has become open source, including, for example, this famous fragment from the source code of the Quake 3 Arena game developed by ID Software and credible developers like John Carmack. I mean, and this is in a mythical, mythical routine uh, that we, would take a full uh, afternoon to go through it and to explain. But you see from the comments in here that it's an incredible piece of software. I mean, if you want to understand what this does, you need all the comments, you need to spend time to looking at it. So in some sense, why I'm taking such time to show you these concrete examples? Because I want you to share with me this idea that was very well put in, in a beautiful article in 2006 by Len Schuster, who was a world director of Computer History Museum, that the source code, these are two examples of source code, actually provides us with a view in the mind of the designer of the software system. So if you do not have the source code or software, you are missing out on a significant, very important part of our knowledge today. And this is, leads me to tell you about commons in general. You know, when we talk about commons, these are uh, resources which are shared and available to all members of our society. So we are used of thinking of commons like the air, the water, or, 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 the, or the natural language, for example. But if you think a little bit about in, in the software source code, which can be reused, understand, reused by other people, this is another part of the commons. It's actually part of the software commons. So all open source software and free software are part of the software commons. So we need to care about them. And then if you look at the period we are going through today, okay, these terrible pandemics, uh, you have seen in many, many different uh, occasions how to fight the pandemics unfettered, free, open access and exchange of scientific knowledge is of paramount importance. And well, you see, source code of the software, which is used in all society and in research and in science, is actually a part of our commons, which is a pillar of open science by itself. Okay, so you need to have access to all this software to understand what the scientific result but where the scientific result actually come from. I mean, this would require a full other type of talk, so we would not really spend too much time on this. But the end part of this presentation is that software source code is a precious part of our knowledge, which is very special because it is at the same time executable, can be run on a machine, and human readable. I hope to have convinced you with a couple of examples given before. So that's the reason why it is so important to make sure we preserve it and we make it accessible to all. Uh, well, this is exactly the mission of the uh, organization that is behind Software Heritage. So Software Heritage, in a nutshell, is a, an organization that has a very precise mission, very focused mission, collect, preserve, and make available the source code of all software which is publicly available out there. So the objective is to preserve our past, our heritage, you see the Apollo 11 source code, but also, or maybe even more, to enable us to understand how software development evolves today. It provides you a kind of telescope to, to observe the galaxy of, of software development, to enable better software development, better science, better society, better industry for all. In doing so, 
So Treasure is building a kind of a reference catalog, a place where you can find the list of all the source code which is out there. But some of you, or most of you, I hope, have already heard of a very popular uh, code hosting collaborative development platform like GitHub or uh, like Bitbucket or like uh, GitLab.com or the many instances of GitLab that are around the world or distribution like Debian or Red Hat or something like this or historical code archive like uh, Citan or Siran or Citan. And there are so many out there, but they're all spread around. We do not have a single place where we can find all, them all. I mean, this is what software is building, a reference catalog. But not only, it's also building a universal archive. And you know, there is a big difference between a code hosting platform like Bitbucket or GitHub and an archive. An archive is a place where you put something, you get a, an identifier for this something, then you can come later, as late as you want, in a year, in two years, in 100 years, and you find the same object still there. Code development platforms are not done for this. I can go there, create a project, modify, rename it, erase it, move it elsewhere. There is no guarantee that what you see today will be there tomorrow. So the big difference is that we are also building an archive. And last but not least, we will see this later on. Uh, this is also the first layer of a very, very fundamental research infrastructure that we all need that must enable massive analysis of all the software source code out there. The software source code on top of which all of our modern societies realize. Okay, it's it. Well, how do we do this? Uh, it, it, it's not an easy fit, right? If you want to actually do something like this, you need to build a, a, a normal infrastructure, and we will see some details. So we decided to, to organize uh, our work in a very structured way. So we, as software heritage, we build an infrastructure that cares about collecting, archiving, preserving, organizing, and exposing all the source code out there to enable application in tons of different areas for cultural heritage, for the industry, for research, or science, for education. But we do not build these applications. We are just the layer on top of which this application can be built. We focus on the difficult part, which is archiving with the software. This is not just slideware. We will go to the website later on, but just, let, let me just give you some example. Software has already created the largest archive ever of software. There are over 150 million projects archived today for over 9 billion unique source code files in this archive. <clears throat> and we build this infrastructure on top of principles which are very clearly stated in our mission statement. So as a technology, everything we build is open source and reuses component from open source. Because I cannot promise you to preserve these precious commons for the long term if I hide the way I do it. So I need to have full knowledge and access to all the components. We want also to have replicas all the way down. We want to try different technology, enable other people to help with different technology. We, we use an intrinsic identifier that we stand the test of times. We keep information which are only facts and provenance. So for every single piece of software we find in the archive, you know when we found it, where, and how we ingested. And as an organization, I do not want software to be closed down or, 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 or uh, in a way or the other. I mean, either shut down or close it down to become a commercial operation. So we are creating a non-profit, multi-stakeholder, international organization whose only mission is to make sure this will last over time. But then if you're curious on how you build such a gigantic archive, let me give you a little bit of a, a peek under the hood. So out there, as I told you, there are so many places where uh, software source code is spread around. So Git, GitHub, very popular, GitLab, very popular, Bitbucket, very popular, but also tons of other places. Package managers like uh, NPM or PyPy, uh, distribution like Debian or Ubuntu or Fedora or uh, whatever, other repositories like uh, Chipan, etc. We need to connect to all of them and get all the source code which is in there. This is not easy. It is not like archiving the web. There is no standard there. So we need to build an adapter for every single one of these uh, uh, code hosting platforms. We are doing this, and in doing this, we need the help of the community, other people, other experts to come and help us building more adapters. 
this is a modular architecture. Once you do this, well, you, you will find out that the way software development is represented when people use GitHub using the Git version system, control system, is not really the same as what happens if you use another version control system like Mercurial. And uh, the format of packages for JavaScript or for Python are not exactly the same. So there are a lot of little differences in there. So if you really want to go for the long term to make this information available for the long term, you need to abstract from all these technical details. And this is what we do. We actually build an extra layer there of adapters that convert all this information on the source code, its history, development, origins, etc., from the particular tool that is used, I mean, Git, Mercurial, uh, whatever, into a single, simple uh, data structure, uh, which is technically, for the technically savvy here, this is, this is a direct acyclic graph built using the technology known as Merkle trees. But in a very simple way, you can think it's a gigantic graph that keeps track of all of this. Where in particular, if a piece of code is used in different places, we spot it and we deduplicate it. And so we keep it only once. And we just remember that it is present in different places. So you see, for example, in this graph here, this particular file content can appear in different places, but we store it only once. And we just keep track of where it comes from. That, that's why we have it up. The result of this is that you have all the history, all the history globally, worldwide, of the development of software source code permanently archived in a unique, gigantic Merkel graph <coughs> data structure. The incredible feat of what we did is that this can be kept in something like 400 terabytes of data. This grows every year, it grows very fast anyway, but today it is more or less 400 terabytes of data. And we have a gigantic graph, which is probably one of the largest social graphs which are publicly available today with 20 billion nodes and almost 300 billion edges in there. Why I'm saying social? Because uh, uh, software is a human built artifact. And when you look at the graph, you see the history of the community that actually built it. So in some sense, it's a kind of a social network. <clears throat> One of the consequences of the fact that we build this particular data structure using modern technology like Merkel Graph, I mean, if you probably never heard about Merkel Graph, but probably you heard about uh, Bitcoins okay, or blockchains or maybe distributed file systems like uh, IPFS or something like this, where the underlying technology is all the same based on cryptography and a particular way of reusing cryptography keys. So we do the same. And so one of the consequences is that for every object which is in the graph, uh, we have the, the ability to provide a unique identifier that is computed out of the object itself. So this is a very simple example of one of these identifiers. So you have a prefix here, SWH, to say this is a software edge identifier. A schema version, number one for the moment, because we the, per, the schema of the identifier may evolve. Then a tag that tells you what is the object type, and this can be an uh, in identifier for a file content, for a directory, for a revision, for a release, for a full status of the uh, version control system. And then you have this long uh, sequence of hexadecimal numbers, which is a cryptographic signature computed out of the object itself. For all the objects in the graph, we have this kind of cryptographic signature that ensure you when you go and check in there that you have exactly the right object. Nobody can change the object without you noticing if you have this identifier. There are also many extensions that allows you to provide contextual information or go down to the uh, line level, but I mean, I will not go into these details today. Let me just notice that this is an emerging standard. It is already present in the Software package that exchange standard from the Linux Foundation version 2.2. Uh, the prefix is registered by, with IANA, and uh, uh, there is a Wikidata property, 6138, that corresponds to this kind of identifiers. Then on the slides, if you download them, I, I invite you to click on the blue links. So these blue links, uh, under these blue links, the identifier like this one, and you will go directly to the source code in the archive. We will see it in the demo later on. Okay. So if you think about it a little bit, so you have this gigantic crawler that gets all the software out there, 
<clears throat> that puts it in a normalized graph, uniform and graph, uh, uniform graph, global representation of the history around there. And for each of these objects, you have this unique identifier computed out of the object that nobody can change and can be used in a distributed way. Well, as a consequence, <clears throat> you see that this infrastructure is actually a revolutionary infrastructure for open source. Because on one side, we are really building the graph of software development. And you know, if you look at the big IT companies around us, most of the big IT companies around us built their uh, business model on the control of big graphs. If you think the graph of the web, uh, this is at the core of the business of people that build their changes, like Google. Uh, the graph of our social relationships is the core of the business of, say, Facebook. The graph of our professional relationship is the core of the business of LinkedIn that was acquired by Microsoft. You see, I mean, a lot of companies are built on full control of a graph which actually is built on public data, okay, but they are the only one having this control. Well, we at Software Energy, we are building the graph of software development, not for me to buy a Ferrari. I have nothing against Ferrari. Somebody listening has a Ferrari, wants to give a tour. I raise my hand, will be more than happy to come there. But we are not there for that reason. We are there to build this important piece of knowledge, common knowledge and make it available to the world okay, for the many, many different uses you can do. The other observation is that by the very technology we are using, which is necessary for the long-term preservation of the, uh, this information, we are not just, just building any graph. We are building a Merkel graph. And the Merkel graph is half of a blockchain. Okay, So we, we are already implementing half of what is needed to have a blockchain, a global blockchain of software development. So we are not in the business of blockchain, and we are not a business. But I just wanted to point out this is another part which is important to notice. A third observation is actually we are building a pillar of open science. Open science today is what is saving us with, confronted to these pandemics. So you needed a scientific article that tell you the result of the last analysis on the coronavirus. You need the data, uh, open data, on which the analysis presented in the article are built. Because you need to understand them, to replicate them, to check that they are correct or not, to build. Uh, 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 understanding and, and support from, from the public on these public decisions. And of course, we need also access to all the open source software which is used in this process. And up to now, this was something that has, has been forgotten. But in some pressure, we had the archive for all the research software. And finally, and the other consequence of the way we are building this infrastructure is that uh, this gigantic graph we are building has already normalized a lot of information. And for people who do machine learning or AI, as uh, they tend to say today, uh, the normalization of the data is one of the very difficult steps when you try to do machine learning. So we are already doing because we need to preserve the data, not for doing machine learning. But the side effect is that this becomes, in some sense, a reference platform for big code analysis. Okay, we have a single uniform data structure with all the history of software development of the world. And you can do a lot of things on top of it. Now, those are a lot of words, okay? So let me give you a little example of uh, how this actually works. I have put on this slide, uh, you will see here on this slide, there are blue links. Uh, I do not know if they can show through the, the video, but I mean, they're actually blue. When you download the PDF, you will see they are blue. Every blue link is something that you can click on, okay? So you f if you click on, then normally this opens the browser. Uh, ah, yes, but I need to go. Here it is. It opens the browser that brings you to a particular place. So this, for example, is a, uh, the door, the entrance door of this archive. You get here some information on the platform we are already hiding. You see, like this. You get the up to date numbers. So no, actually, today is in 153 millions of uh, 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 projects already archived. And you can do some searching here. Like, uh, for example, the Apollo 11 uh, 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 source code that we wanted. Uh, here there are many, many, many copies of this, for example. 
Ah, no, this is not the right one. There are many copies which are not totally complete. Let me see if I find the one now. It's not this one. No. Uh, so probably... That tons of different copies. Uh, here it is, for example, here are many, many versions of the uh, source code of the Apollo 11 code. You see, this was uh, recovered by Ron Barkley. And for example, if I go there uh, and visit all the different files, you see, these are presented as really the real source code, which is behind the software which was running on the Apollo 11. You can browse it, and then you will find out that, for example, this programmer back in the 60s, who says that programmers don't have a culture? You see this part here? Uh, you see, Rony Swaki Madipense, and I think you in England, you know very well what this means. I mean, they were just telling the other people, hey, you don't believe software is important, you know, it, you just wait, you will see how important it will become in the future. And then here, there are the constants which are used to control the, the, the rockets that uh, to, to spin them off from, or on during the landing. So it's very important not to touch this part unless you know what you do. And so the comment here is in old Latin, nolis et tangere, don't touch unless you know. You see, you can visit here, you can find this kind of thing. And then when you can open this permalink here, for each of these files, for each of the 20 billion objects in the archive, you find this cryptographic identifier that has already been built for you. You can get the contextual information, then you can copy this permalink that points to exactly this object. And then you can put this identifier inside a blog post on Twitter, on a documentation, on a supply chain traceability contract or something like this. And then uh, when you click on this link now, I'm simulating clicking on the link by copy and pasting, okay? You will be placed exactly in the same place as the, the place from which the link was computed with exactly the same context, same file, same file number, same position, same, same uh, uh, file name, etc. So notice this is not a trivial thing to do because uh, uh, you know it, it is not like doing something like this on a typical code hosting platform. The big difference is one, we are in archive, so what you see today, you will see it tomorrow, nobody can remove it. And the other thing is these identifiers do not depend on any particular version control system package format. They can be used exactly the same way across the full system. Well, actually, uh, another thing I would like to show you is the ability. Uh, I have told you what we do, we go and call a lot of places. But the other thing we have made possible today, it enables anybody around the planet to point us any uh, piece of source code which is available out there, maintained under one of the many popular version control systems known today, Git Mercurial version here. Uh, add, uh, the place where the software is, just click on submit, and that's it. So you have told us that there is some important piece of software out there that should be saved. So this just go to this queue here. See this uh, uh, read tape, read tape. It's the same thing I've been put here just right now. It's not yet scheduled. It is in the queue to be uh, archived, and very soon will be archived in our uh, archive. Okay. But again, there are many, many other examples you can look here, how it can be used for research, how it can be used for uh, uh, various applications, like for example, recovering the history of landmark legacy software for many country in collaboration with UNESCO, if you want. But we'll not go through the details. Uh, yeah. Uh, now that I gave you a little bit of a an understanding or, or, or a feeling on what we are doing, how we are doing it, but technically, I imagine you will have tons of questions about how we are doing it uh, organizationally. How can we actually make sure that all this effort is made for the long term? And actually, we are building uh, what we do for the long term, 
One big sign of this is a long-term agreement we have with UNESCO that gives you an idea of how this is an uh, international part of the human culture heritage. And we have support from many, many organizations, some of which we will probably recognize. Uh, there are many more that you can find following this link. And these are people that share the vision. They do not put money, they put support and mind share in, in, in this kind of uh, uh, operation. Then you have people that actually support the, the, the effort of building an infrastructure. This is a serious cost. It's a large infrastructure, kind of building a Google or software source code. It's not something you do on your weekend or spare time or volunteer time. So big thanks go to INRIA, which is my current institution that decided to support the initial phase of creating uh, this infrastructure. And then you see here all the current sponsors that make donations that make our work possible. Uh, CNRS, for example, is the largest research organization in Europe. Uh, uh, the Ministry of Research in, uh, in France, you have a big bank, Société Générale, you have Microsoft, Intel, even Huawei. You have uh, uh, different co-sponsors, including the, the Open Invention Network. You probably heard about this organization, very important organization over here. Big university, you have even GitHub and Google, you have National Archive in the Netherlands, different uh, uh, university, my original home university, University of Pisa. And of course, you see there is a lot of blank space, we need more people to lend a hand, but you see, we already started diversifying the set of sponsors that support what we are doing today. But this is not all. We are also creating a mirror network. Because even if you manage to build an archive, even if you manage to have a lot of people supporting it, problems can still happen. Okay, a data center can be destroyed, a, a, a earthquake can destroy a, 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 a place. A bad legislation, like the case of the copyright reform in Europe a couple of years ago, may endanger any kind of operation. So you need to rely on an advice that comes from one of the first presidents of the United States. You see, this is what Thomas Jefferson was answering to somebody who was sending him some pieces of precious documents which were saved from fire and asking him, how can we make sure they do not disappear? And this is the answer this Thomas Jefferson said. It was, yes, it's very precious. What is gone is gone. But for what remains, uh, the good solution is not by building a gigantic uh, vault with big locks and hide all this single copy of the document, but by make so many copies of this document that no accident can actually touch them. And so we are doing exactly this. We are creating an international mirror network, and we need more. Uh, the first very big institutional mirror is under construction right now in Italy by Enea, which is a large national agency for uh, new technologies. And uh, it will help, when this is done, we will have much better resilience, and we can show how that can be done. We are also trying to raise awareness about the importance of software source code. Uh, so in November 2018, 40 international experts met in Paris to actually come out with a Paris code on software source code. So this is not just software, it is much bigger, it is software source code as it is. This code is published it is the important policy tools. So you need to convince people in your companies or institutional organization, governments of the importance of code. Please go download it, get it, read it. It's, it's a precious piece of information. It's a precious policy tools, which is already being used in different kind of uh, documents. Recent news, kind of breaking news. We are also trying to collaborate with the European initiatives, in particular one which is called EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud to actually bring software to their attention, because this was something they were basically forgetting. And so this report, which was published in uh, December, it's a, again important policy tools in open science about the importance of software produced in research. And one of the recommendations made there is that all research software should be made available under an open source license by default. And all deviation from this default practice should be properly motivated. Uh, pretty well the contrary of what happens today in, many, in too many places. You see, uh, not only this, we are partnering with public organizations, like for example with a, a service of the Prime Minister here in France, 
to make sure all software produced by the public sector is properly archived. You see this site, you can go there, it is code.etalab.gov.org. You will find the list of tons of different source code produced by the public sector in France. And this little logo here shows that it has been archived in software heritage, so it will not go away. Um, so you see, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ambitious project with many ramifications, but we are really trying to leverage the power of the community, working with others to achieve these results. And every now and then, we are also obliged to stop our work and do some firefighting. Uh, the last example was uh, summer, so one year ago, more than, more than one year ago, it back at one of these popular uh, hosting platforms, just announced that for different business reasons, they were phasing out support to one of these versions of the system. The consequence was that 250,000 repositories containing precious source code would be erased almost a year later. Okay? So when we saw that, I mean, this is our mission, make sure things don't go away. So we stopped our work for a moment, teamed up with a, a specialist team of experts in Mercurial, uh, get funding by NNN, many thanks to them for, uh, for this work. And when Bitbucket actually pulled the plug, uh, end of July 2020, the full copy was already archived live here. You know, this is not just uh, preserving stuff that nobody cares about. You can find just a few days after that we made this uh, announcement public, this tweet by a researcher who said, hey, I just realized when ASCLNet, which is an organization keep track of the source code of astrophysics, they told me that the software associated to my paper has gone because Bitbucket has, has remained it. I thought everything was locked, but someone archived all the repos. Very classy move by October Central Australia. Okay, so I mean, apart from being something nice to hear from people when they say something like this, uh, this tells you that, you know, just supposing that because people consider a piece of software important, they will archive it, that is not exactly how things works. Maybe you, you just suppose that your software will stay there forever. You put it on Bitbucket or GitHub or, or, or GitHub or one of your institutional repository, you suppose it will stay there forever, you just stop caring, and then you come back a year later, it is no longer there. So it, it's not just deposit that is enough. You need to really proactively go and get everything which is out there before it goes away. Okay. You really wanted to see the real quit. I didn't fabricate it. You click on the blue link, here you will find it. So now gearing a little bit towards the end, of, you see, uh, you can help. Well, whoever you are listening to this presentation, you can help. For example, right now, we are looking for experts to help with a couple of things. One is to extend our coverage to build more of these adapters I have shown you in the previous slides uh, to, to track more uh, software code hosting platform or package managers and to handle more version control system or package formats. And here we are very grateful to the Sloan Foundation who actually provided us with some funding that we can use to give out mini grants to experts in this kind of technology they want to help, want to help not just as volunteers, but also being paid for that. It, it's an application, it's open, it's a running basis. While money is there, we will keep giving these grants. Uh, if you're interested, <laughs> move fast because the, the, the applications are coming. And the other thing is, there is a lot of incredibly important landmark legacy software which is going away because the founding father and mothers of computing are unfortunately passing away. And so we have worked with UNESCO to build up a process, which is called the software edge the acquisition process. It describes exactly a different step involved in rescuing, curating, archiving, and making available landmark legacy software. Here also, some limited funding might be available through UNESCO. I mean, this is out of my control. But in any case, at least the process is clearly out there. It's somebody interesting coming from history or sociology. <coughs> history of technology might be very close in doing to or national archives. Then, of course, this is the part where we give something to you. Then there is a part where you can give us to us uh, something to us. I mean, anybody can join, become a sponsor of a member. I mean, this is typically for higher tickets. You can see the program following the blue link here. 
But anybody can also make a donation. There is a simple donate button on, on there. And do not underestimate the importance even of a small donation for a project like this one. And finally, <clears throat> you can also very easily, simply, uh, now that you know the software should exist, use it in your work, explore it, save source code. You know it's relevant. Just click on the link as I showed to on how to do it. That's really an important contribution. If you know how to program everything in our infrastructure is open source, please come in and help. And if nothing of this is something that you want to do or have time to do, just spread the word. This is very important to help moving forward this essential program. But I will think I will stop here with just this final uh, comment. I mean, we are really open. Please come in. And uh, uh, you can help, or everybody can help, building a kind of a library of Alexander or source code for recovering the past and touching our source code. Or even an incredible instrument for exploring the evolution of software. And this is important, a kind of CERN for software. This is important for society as a whole, for industry and for research. But I think I managed to stay in the 40 minutes. I will stop here and I will be more than happy to get questions from anybody who is curious. Thank you so much, Roberto. I think we've got our first question up from Amanda. Roberto, that was absolutely brilliant. Really, really interesting. Um, and I, I've heard some of it before, but it's great to contextualize it all again. So thank you. I know you're talking about different funding routes and different activities. How can we in the UK help more? You, you also talked about the French Prime Minister being involved. We're seeing big shifts and announcements regularly coming out of DC. Absolutely. And can we, how can we help you to get into all of that? What do you need from us? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's a very interesting point. For example, in the UK, I know you, you have been moving fast uh, forward with, uh, with open source for a long time. Uh, and I wonder, uh, I, I would be delighted, I mean, <laughs> to counter a little bit this Brexit in such a way to reestablish a collaboration. I will be delighted to see the UK creating a mirror of software heritage and using software heritage, for example, for archiving software which is provide uh, produced by the uh, public sector in the UK. Now, I, I, I hope not to disclose, to disclose something which is, no, it should not be private anyway. So I have been contacted by people in, in the National Archive in, in uh, the UK about using uh, uh, software heritage. But I, as far as I understand, they were more interested in just taking our software, running it locally to archive just the, the software produced by the government on local premises, mm -hmm. which is kind of a, of course, it's a very good thing to do, and we are ha happy they use Sorry. our software and do it locally. But I think this is kind of missing the point. So when you want to archive the software produced by a UK government, you do not want just to archive that particular piece of software. You also want to archive all the dependencies, all the other projects that are used to make that run. So if you want to have everything, you need to have the full archive, not just archive of the three files that you want, you producing in your particular lab or institution. So the right solution there is, uh, yes, I want a copy under my control. I understand you want a copy in the UK under your control. That, that's perfectly normal concern, and it was already built in our uh, uh, strategy. We have this mirror program. Just become a mirror. You have a full copy under your full control. So you have sovereignty on one side and collaboration. You see, this is a key message I would like to spread around, starting for Europe, because we are more used to work together, mm -hmm. but globally. So there is this issue of sovereignty, which is so important. It is, it is all over the news today because you see all this fight about the vaccine. Uh, it is built in the UK, but not sent to, to France, or we have it in France, but we don't ship it to other places. All this crazy thing. So everybody understands the importance of having control on something yeah. which is strategic. So they want yes. their own copy, the own pharmaceutical industry. But you see, in our world, in the world of software source code, when you have something like software which is already designed to be replicated, 
then you can have your cake and eat it too. You work on this single node, be part of this common organization, and get your full copy and your full control in your country. So that way, every country can be sovereign without rivality in some sense. In some ways, Roberta, that's what Open UK is all about, where we focus locally but collaborate globally. And Absolutely. it fits exactly within that model and what you're saying. So can I suggest that you and I maybe talk offline after this and see if we can help you with the, the archive and whether we can get whoever you need at our end to be supporting you. And we're, we're actively Absolutely. talking with DCMS and others who may be able to help as well, because it would make lots and lots of sense, especially if we tell them they're having their cake and eating it. Like Absolutely. I will be more than happy to work on this. And you know, there is also an issue of how you create uh, it, again, I mean, 40 minutes you cannot really squeeze in on five years of work or six years of work, right? But there are so many different things you can think about. Uh, the work we have been doing for scholarly software, for research software, is about also quality metadata, curation of metadata about the software that is used. This is very valuable in the public sector also. But you want to have quality metadata about the software components that go into your government infrastructure, for example. You want to share the, the standard for this metadata. You want to share the effort of qualifying all these components. I mean, this is nothing new for you and me, Amanda. You know, in the open source, I mean, we, we are used to that. But if other people might not know immediately the value that come out of having a single global archive on which people can contribute qualified information on, on metadata, on their usage, etc. Okay, and you, we have technology being developed to do this. But I agree. Let's take this offline and, and let's space for, for uh, other questions. Thank you very much. I think we've got a couple more questions. Why do you want to go next? I can ask it. Ooh, but we have another question about how about reusing the software for other purposes? And um, was the next question. So sorry, I, I have difficulty oh. hearing. Oh, sorry. Can, can, you, can, you, can you say it again? Yes, I yes, hear you, but there is some kind of noise or so. Just, just repeat it. Don't, no yes, problem. Of course. So the question was about how about reusing software for the, the software for other purposes. Ah, um, well, let me clarify a bit. So, software agent is a global software archive. So you find in software agent basically all the source code that we can manage to get our hands on. But when you ask the question is, can I reuse it? Uh, no, wait a second. The question is not immediately here. Is it about the software we build for the software agent infrastructure, or is it about the software we archive in, in software heritage? And um, oh, hey, that awesome question. Because uh, there are two things. So, I mean, if somebody wants to take our software, the software we build, the software heritage, to run this infrastructure and reuse it, of course, you can do it. It, it, is, uh, it is open source. You can do it right mm -hmm. away. Okay, if you, you want to use it internally in your organization, etc. Just notice that Totrice is much more than an open source software. It is an infrastructure. So our main focus today is not to support you when you want to install a copy of our software in that place, because this is uptime for my engineering team that needs to be dedicated to make sure the infrastructure runs well. You are free to take the software and try to use it, but I would suggest to try more to contribute to what we're doing. And if you need to have a full copy of the archive, become a mirror. But of course, you can use our software. Roberto, can, yes. can I explain myself a little better? Sure. Uh, I'm thinking in to use the uh, repository that you have to use for another purposes. Suppose you have to use that for humanitarian purposes, to save some knowledge that if the, you lost that, you can uh, damage or, or make uh, suffering some aspects of society. Absolutely. In, uh, uh, in that case, in what, so, we, what, 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 what would you like to do? Mm, suppose you have records, records of vaccination or maybe the development of the vaccine. You have that knowledge. Yeah, sure, you are right. So, Okay, now I understand better your, your question. So let, let me reformulate and you tell me if I understand well. The question is, all this technology we are building here, and even directly the infrastructure, so software edge, 
Can you use it to archive something else than software, than software for example, uh, uh, vaccination records or uh, some other information which is uh, out there? For example, you put it on GitHub and then you ask us to archive it. Is this a question you, you are asking? Yes, and how to preserve it and use it in, a, in, in another format or maybe for the other purpose. You, you, wa you want to know how are the 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 the, the damage that the vaccine occasion for uh, for some people. Maybe you want to understand that, okay? And yeah. you you don't want to lose that data. Yeah, no, I understand, understand. So, okay, let me give you uh, my standard answer here. So, for the moment here at Software Edge, we do not filter anything. So, if there is a software repository, and in software repository there are projects that contain something which is any kind of software, but also data, for example, records of vaccination, something like this, we do not filter them out. As far as most of what is in the repository is software, we accept to store also that data. We do not filter it out. It is not the recommended use of software heritage, but it is something customary in research, for example. You, you have a lot of people who have data used for doing analysis, etc which is on a repository and they want to store it alongside or separate from the software, it ends up in software. We do not filter that out, so you can do it. It is not what we recommend, so we prefer to have data on data repositories and software just for software, because otherwise there is noise when you try to do analysis of the software, but there is no filter in place right now, so you can do it if you want. Any other? Yeah, very welcome. Any other questions? Adrian, do you have a question? Hi, hi, hi Roberto. Yeah. Thanks for a great presentation. Really, really enjoyed it. I, I was just wondering. I think you kind of half answered the question there uh, when you were answering George. But my question was, you know, when I link, say, for example, a new GitHub repository, is when that code has been moved to Surfwood Heritage, does it does any checks of licensing happen, or is it kind of up to the, the person that is actually linking it to make sure that they are actually a good actor and that anything they put up can be re reused freely? Um, you know. Yeah. Or, very you very good question. Yeah. Very good question. I understand. So uh, I could point you to the. Um, if you go to the website of Software Edge in the footer down, there is a link which is called Legal. Legal brings you to terms of use, ethic charter, etc. A, a lot of work has gone into that, to, to going through experts worldwide to try to get something which is, uh, I mean, kind of agreed upon by a lot of people we trust. And so our position is this one. We are kind of an archive. So our goal is to make sure things do not get lost. This doesn't mean that everything that you find in storage is something you can reuse like you want. It is up to you to check the licenses of the object inside and see what you can do with that. So uh, the fact of finding a piece of software in software heritage doesn't mean it is open source, doesn't mean you can reuse it for your purposes. It's up to you to check it. What I can tell you is that we are working. We have a lot of things under the hood right now because you know development is a very complex operation, especially at this scale. You know, there is an old mantra of a friend of mine who was saying, big data means big problems. I can tell you this is pretty true. So the developing technology that works at this scale is really not easy, and especially when you are not Google or Microsoft and you don't have billions and hundreds of uh, thousands of developers working on it. But we are working on technology that will make it much easier for people visiting the archive to get an idea of what is a license where this object has come from. You know, there are very interesting questions you can ask. For example, you can go to the archive, you find a piece of software interesting for you and say, hmm, is it still very actively used? Uh, maybe the, the, the main branch is dead, nobody's committing here, but isn't there some, uh, somewhere else a copy that somebody made and that is still actively maintained? So not a fork like you do on GitHub, but just somebody that got a copy of the code, did some work and pushed it somewhere else. Well, looking into software heritage, we can answer these questions. So we are developing technology to these kind of things, which is really revolutionary because nobody else has something like this out there. And we are not building a startup, right? We are, we are building it to make it available for everybody, for making it easy for you and other people to actually access this body of knowledge as efficiently 
as usefully as possible. Thank you, Roberto. I think I think that uh, that feature would be very interesting, right? I think it's a it's a very useful tool to have. Absolutely. And there is also there are also mechanisms and their work to actually find a way for qualified organization or institution to deposit metadata which is qualified about software we archive. For example, again, I didn't want to spend too much time in the connection with open science here. But we have been working with the leading journals around the world with a new organization with the National Open Access Portal in France and hope to have this in other places soon uh, to make sure that when uh, software is associated to research article and, and curated by librarians or by people that actually go through it to make sure that the, the record is clean and well done, uh, we are getting this software deposited in software Azure together with this metadata and we keep track that this qualified metadata comes from this particular organization. So tomorrow it should be easier to build up, build portals that allows you to say, hey, I would like to see what are the software developed by uh, leading edge uh, research organization worldwide associated to this kind of field of research. And uh, it should be possible Again, with enough resources, enough engineering, enough money, enough time, et cetera, et cetera, it should be possible to provide this kind of view to everybody. And this will be a game changer. Great. Thank you so much, Roberto. That seems a good point to end today's session. Bang on time. Um, next week, we've got Jim Killock of the Open Rights Group. Um, and then we'll have a break until the 23rd of April when the Sessions will start again. So thank you very much again, Roberto, and hopefully see you. It's a pleasure. Thank week. you for having me. Thank Bye. you.